Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Chuck Wilson and I am the pastor at Bethel Church in Wallaceburg. We're glad that you've joined us this morning. Just before we dive into God's word, let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to get to know you better through your word. Use it to challenge us again today, we pray. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have been with us over the course of the last few months, you'll know that we are in the middle of a series in the book of the Gospel of Mark. This morning, we're looking at a passage from Mark chapter 9. So let's begin. Phil Calloway is a name that you may or may not be familiar with. He's a very funny Canadian Christian from Alberta, in fact. He speaks close to a hundred times all across North America to corporations and at conference and, and in churches as well. Beyond that, Phil has written close to two dozen books, including Laughing Matters. Uh, one of my personal favorites is uh, I Used to Have Answers, Now I Have Kids. <laughs> and uh, this is interesting, Making Life Rich Without Any Money. Uh, Phil's also a frequent guest on national radio and television programs. But he says he didn't know what to say when his young children asked if their mommy was going to die. Uh, obviously, this picture is much later, but uh, it's, it's uh, the earliest one that I could find of the family. You see, Ramona was suffering from horrible seizures when the kids were little. Hundreds of friends and relatives prayed, but Ramona's weight eventually slipped to 90 pounds. Uh, medical experts were stupefied. They tried everything. But by the fall of 1996, the seizures were occurring, occurring daily, uh, sometimes even hourly. Phil rarely left Ramona's side. He wondered whether or not she would ever see her 30th birthday. But one evening, when things looked utterly hopeless, Phil paced their dark backyard when he fell on his knees and cried out, God, I can't take it anymore. Please do something. In that moment, Phil said, out of nowhere, a doctor's name came to mind. Phil called. That doctor saw Ramona the next day and diagnosed that she had a rare chemical deficiency, and so uh, she began treatment. Within a week, Ramona's seizures had ended. Her eyes sparkled again with life. The miracle was so incredible that Phil said, God gave me back my wife. And when I read that story, I'm reminded of the one that we find in Mark chapter 9. It goes like this. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible 
for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Only by prayer. As I consider this passage, it it seems to me that it's not really one for the spiritually elite. It's not really one for people who have it all together, spiritually speaking. I think it's probably much more meaningful for those of us who struggle with our faith from time to time, who know what's expected, but who have difficulty living up to that standard. I think it's for those who, on occasion, might need a a spiritual tune-up in their prayer lives, which I suppose could pretty well include the vast majority of us. I think if we were really being honest, many of us would have to admit that, well, perhaps our prayer life lacks consistency. I mean, prayer looks kind of like this. It's, it's kind of feast or famine, really. Desert or oasis experience for us. We have these long, arid, dry spells when we really don't pl- pray that much. They're occasionally interrupted by these brief plunges into the water. I mean, we can go days, weeks, sometimes even months without consistently talking to God. But then something happens. Um, maybe, maybe we hear a sermon. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe we, we read a book or, or uh, much more likely, we experience a tragedy. It's something that leads us to pray. And so we, we dive in. And amazingly, we find ourselves renewed and refreshed in that moment. But unfortunately for so many of us, it lasts only for a time. I mean, when the journey continues, we once again find ourselves trudging through the barren wilderness. For some of us, we'd have to admit our prayers lack consistency. Well, perhaps others would have to confess that our prayers lack sincerity. (laughs) You know what I mean? If you've seen the movie, you'll understand. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Thank thee, Lord, for daily bread. Amen. What? (laughs) I mean, we know what to say, but it doesn't really mean much to us. Or, Or here's another standby. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Yeah. Please don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with either of those prayers, but but sometimes they can get a bit hollow, can't they? A little bit more liturgical than life-giving. They might be daily, but they can be pretty dull. And though we've memorized them, they can come to lack meaning. So some of our prayers, they lack consistency. And some of them, they lack sincerity. And for others, some of our prayers lack honesty. Because in truth, we're not really sure that they make any difference. I mean, if God really is sovereign, if he's really in control, then what purpose do my prayers make? And so we buy into the theology of Doris Day. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours, you see. 
Que sera, sera. I suppose I'm dating myself in knowing that, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's what we believe, though. I mean, why bother praying? Let me state that if you relate to any of those struggles in prayer, then I think this story is for you. Because it's not about some spiritual giant who calls down the fire of God. And, and it's not about someone who's, whose knees are calloused because of the amount of time he's, he's spent on them in God's presence. This story is not about someone who will make you feel guilty about how little you pray. No, I, I think he's perhaps just the opposite. He's just this, this normal guy with a sick son who's desperately in need of a miracle. He's a guy whose request certainly wasn't eloquent, but friend, it did prove effective. He's a man who reminds us that the power of prayer is not in the one who offers it, but in the one who hears it. And if you remember anything today, remember that line. The power of prayer is not in the one who offers it, but in the one who hears it. This man prays out of desperation. His only son was demon-possessed. That vile spirit had left him deaf, mute, and subject to epileptic seizures. Now, please, let me clarify at this point that not all those who are deaf, mute, or epileptic are demon-possessed. I mean, we would never suggest that because the Bible doesn't teach it. All we can safely say at this point is that in this particular case, the source of this child's affliction, affliction was demonic in nature. You following me? Okay, well, let's get back to the story. When Jesus asked, the boy's father explained that ever since his son was young, the demon had attempted to end his boy's life. He'd thrown him into the fire to, to burn him or into the water to try and drown him. And as we hear the story centuries later, I think many of us can still imagine this dad's pain. As other kids in the neighborhood were learning to walk and talk, this man saw his son suffer. As other kids were learning to read and write, his boy was just struggling to survive. His child needed constant attention because you just never knew when the next attack would come. And as he spoke to Jesus, it's clear that he was desperate and tired. His plea certainly reflected both. If he can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Doesn't sound too confident, does he? Not the, the prayer of a warrior, is it? You know, I think one word could have made such a big difference. What if he would said since instead of if? Since you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. But he didn't say that. He said, if he can. In fact, in the original language, it's emphatic. Uh, what that means is that doubt is implied. It's as if the man was saying, I don't have much hope, Jesus. This one's probably beyond even you, but if you can. It's classic, isn't it? <laughs> Again, not your typical prayer warrior petition, is it? And yet, friend, if that prayer sounds a little bit like yours, don't be discouraged. Because that's really where prayer begins. It starts with this, this yearning, this, this honest appeal. We are just ordinary people staring at the Red Sea in front of us and the Egyptian army behind us needing a miracle and crying out, God, help us! There's no pretense. There's, there's no boasting. Just this heartfelt plea for help. You know, it seems to me that Sometimes we're tempted to wait to pray until we think we know how. I mean, we've heard the prayers of the spiritually elite. We've read of the rigors of the disciplined, and we're convinced how far we have to go. 
And since we'd rather not pray than pray poorly, we just don't bother. Or we pray infrequently. We're waiting for we're waiting to pray until we learn how. Well, friend, it's a good thing that this man didn't make that same mistake. Clearly, he wasn't much of a prayer. And in truth, his wasn't much of a prayer. He even admits it. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Not exactly inspiring. Doesn't do much to encourage faith, does it? And yet Jesus responded. He responded, I believe, not to the eloquence of the man, but to the pain of the man. Now, Jesus clearly had many reasons to disregard this man's request. Uh, for one thing, he was just returning from the Mount of Transfiguration. That was where he was, had taken a few of his disciples and, and met with God face to face. Scripture tells us that, that Jesus' face shone with the glory of God, that the burdens of earth were replaced with the splendor of heaven. Moses and Elijah came to encourage him. Jesus was lifted above the trials of life and was reminded for a time of the big picture. The journey up was probably pretty exhilarating, but the journey down must have been disheartening. When Galen and I were first married 35 years ago, we lived right downtown in the heart of the city of Toronto. We would often head north to Barrie on Friday nights to stay with her mom and dad. And we did it because at that time, Barrie was everything that Toronto was not. Now, in the last 30-some years, it's changed. But, but back then, it was cool and it was quiet. It was peaceful and calm. But on Sunday morning, we would always get up early and head back to the little church that we served in the St. Lawrence Market neighborhood. Often that trip was admittedly kind of depressing. The pace of life, the, the congestion of the city, and that the yellowy-brown haze that always hung over the city. I mean, it often made us feel like just turning around and heading the other direction. That's how we felt after just a, a couple days in the country. You can imagine how Jesus must have felt after a glimpse of heaven. And look at the chaos that greets his return. The disciples are arguing. The crowd is listening to the debate perhaps waiting for the, the teachers of the law and the preachers, Jesus guys, to duke it out. And there's this young boy, someone who'd suffered his whole life, is there on public display like some sort of animal in the zoo. And there's his dad, who'd come for help. He's disillusioned, wondering why no one can assist him. It's no wonder that Jesus says what he does. You unbelieving generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? I mean, I wonder if the difference between heaven and earth had ever been so clear. I mean, where's the faith? The disciples have failed. The scribes are amused. The demons have been victorious, and a father despairs. Well, Maybe you can relate. Perhaps your life is a long way from heaven, too. <laughs> Noisy kids rather than singing angels. Divisive faith, where it seems like the church is a pretty good place to be if you're looking for a good fight. Overwhelming problems. You can't remember when you didn't wake up to that demon. And yet, friend... Out of the din of doubt comes a timid voice. If you can do anything. Does a plea like that make any difference? Well, let Mark answer that question. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, 
come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. What we find is that, in fact, this upset the disciples a bit. I mean, I imagine they felt a little upstaged, kind of made them look bad. And so as soon as they got away from the crowd, they asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? And his answer, this kind can come out only by prayer. What prayer? Well, Jesus, certainly. But, but what prayer in this story really made the difference? Was it the prayer of the apostles? No, <laughs> they didn't pray. That's why they couldn't cast the demon out. It must have been the prayer of the scribes, right? Maybe they, they went to the temple and interceded on this child's behalf. No, the scribes apparently didn't pray either that it must have been the people. Maybe maybe they held an all-night vigil for this boy. Nope. The people didn't pray, never bent a knee. Then what prayer led Jesus to cast out the demon? Well, friends, there's only one person who calls out to God in this story, and it is the honest, very simple prayer of a hurting man. And since God is more moved by our hurt than by our eloquence, he responded, Well, I said enough. I was thinking about all of this when I came across this story with which we'll conclude. This is perhaps a face that you'll recognize. After successfully separating numerous Siamese twins and continuing to refine the techniques of several complicated surgeries, Dr. Ben Carson has become known throughout the world as a premier brain surgeon. He also uh, is uh, pretty heavily involved in U.S. politics as well. But what you may not know about him, what most people wouldn't know, is that because of an uncontrolled temper as a child, Dr. Carson's career was almost over before it began. In his book entitled Take the Risk, Dr. Carson writes about the day he invited God to help him deal with this critical character flaw. He wrote, One day, as a 14-year-old ninth grader, I was hanging out with my friend Bob, listening to the radio, when he suddenly leaned over and dialed the tuner to another station. Well, Dr. Carson said I'd been enjoying the song playing, and so I reached over and, and I turned it back. Bob switched stations again, maybe thinking he was being funny. But a wave of rage welled up inside of me, Almost without thinking, I pulled out the pocket knife that I always carried and in one motion lunged viciously right at my friend's stomach. Incredibly, miraculously, really. The point of the knife struck Bob's large metal belt buckle and the blade snapped off in my hands. Bob looked up at me and was too shocked to say anything. But I could read the terror in his eyes. I, I, I'm sorry, I sputtered, dropped the knife and ran for home, horrified by what I'd just done. Dr. Carson said I, I burst into our empty house. I locked myself in the bathroom and began to weep. I could no longer deny that I had a severe anger problem and that I'd never be able to achieve my dream of, of being a doctor with that kind of temper. I admitted to myself and to God that there was no way I could control this. And so I prayed, Lord, you've got to help me. Take this temper away. I believe you can change me. Then I opened my Bible there on the bathroom floor, 
it opened to the book of Proverbs, and my eyes fell on Proverbs 16.32. It says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The verse convicted me, but it also gave me hope. I felt God telling me that although he knew everything about me, he still loved me. That because he made me, he was the only one who could change me. And that he would. Gradually, Ben said, I stopped crying. My hands quit shaking. And I was filled with that sweet assurance that God had heard and answered my prayer. He said, many years later, time has shown that uncontrolled anger has never again been a threat to me or to anyone around me. God has provided and will continue to provide whatever strength I need to control my anger. Friend, our, our prayers may be awkward. Our, our attempts may be feeble, like the man in this story. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who who says it, our prayers really do make a difference. And so, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the challenge from your word this morning to continue to believe that you are one who loves to, good, to give good gifts to your children, who responds to our prayers, who assures us that our prayers really do make a difference. In these challenging days, we're asking for your continued help, that we would continue to believe that you are able to deliver us, and that you are working behind the scene to bring all things together for good for those of us who love you and who've been called according to your purpose. And so, Watch over your people this week. Keep us safe. Help us to be wise, full of faith, and not of fear. And these things we ask, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. And thanks for being with us this morning.